Good afternoon, everybody. I just met again with my National Security Council on the campaign to destroy ISIL. I want to thank Secretary Carter and Chairman Dunford, who just returned from meetings with our coalition partners in the Middle East, for hosting us and for their continued leadership of our men and women in uniform. I last updated the American people on our campaign in June, shortly after the horrifying attack in Orlando. In the weeks since, we've continued to be relentless in our fight against ISIL. And on the ground in Syria and Iraq, ISIL continues to lose territory. Tragically, however, we have also seen that ISIL still has the ability to direct and inspire attacks. So we've seen terrible bombings in Iraq and in Jordan, in Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Afghanistan, attacks on an Istanbul airport, a restaurant in Bangladesh, Bastille Day celebrations in a church in France, and a music festival in Germany. In fact, the decline of ISIL in Syria and Iraq appears to be causing it to shift to tactics that we've seen before, an even greater emphasis on encouraging high-profile terrorist attacks, including in the United States. As always, our military, diplomatic, intelligence, homeland security, and law enforcement professionals are working around the clock with other countries and with communities here at home to share information and prevent such attacks. And over the years, they've prevented many. But as we've seen, it is still very difficult to detect and prevent lone actors or small cells of terrorists who are determined to kill the innocent and are willing to die. And that's why, as we discussed today, we're going to keep going after ISIL aggressively across every front of this campaign. Our air campaign continues to hammer ISIL targets. More than 14,000 strikes so far, more than 100,000 sorties, including those hitting the ISIL core in Raqqa and in Mosul. And in stark contrast to ISIL, which uses civilians as human shields, America's armed forces will continue to do everything in our power to avoid civil uh, civilian casualties. With our extraordinary technology, we're conducting the most precise air campaign in history. After all, it is the innocent civilians of Syria and Iraq who are suffering the most and who need to be saved from ISIL's terror. And so when there are allegations of civilian casualties, we take them very seriously. We work to find the facts, to be transparent, and to hold ourselves accountable for doing better in the future. We continue to take out senior ISIL leaders and commanders. This includes ISIL's Deputy Minister of War, Basim Muhammad al-Bajari, a top commander in Mosul, Hatim Talib al-Hamdani, and in yet another significant loss for ISIL, its Minister of War, Umar al-Shishani. None of ISIL's leaders are safe, and we are going to keep going after them. On the ground in Iraq, local forces keep pushing ISIL back. In a major success, Iraqi forces, with coalition support, finally liberated Fallujah. Now they're clearing ISIL fighters from more areas up the Euphrates Valley, and Iraqi forces retook the strategic air base at uh, Kayara, just 40 miles from Mosul, now the last major ISIL stronghold in Iraq. Given the success, the additional 560 U.S. support personnel that I ordered to Iraq last month will help turn this base into a logistical hub and launch pad for Iraqi forces as they push into Mosul. Meanwhile, in Syria, a coalition of local forces backed by our Special Operations Forces and airstrikes continues to take the fight to ISIL as well. The coalition is fighting its way into the town of Manbij, a gateway for ISIL fighters coming in and terrorists heading out to attack Europe, which is why ISIL is fighting hard to hold it. As ISIL is beaten back, we're gaining vast amounts of intelligence, thousands of documents, thumb drives, digital files, which we will use to keep destroying ISIL's networks and stop foreign fighters. We also continue to uh, intensify our efforts against al-Qaeda in Syria, which, no matter what name it calls itself, cannot be allowed to maintain a safe haven to train and plot attacks against us. Uh, I do want to step back and note the broader progress that has been made in this campaign so far. Two years ago, ISIL was racing across Iraq to the outskirts of Baghdad itself, and to many observers, ISIL looked invincible. Since then, in Iraq, ISIL has lost at the Manjib Dam, at Tikrit, at Beji, 
uh, at Sinjar, at Ramadi, at Heat, at Rudba, and now Fallujah. In Syria, ISIL's lost at Kobani and Tel Abayad, and the Tishran Dam and al Shaddadi. ISIL has lost territory uh, across vast stretches of the border with Turkey and almost all major transit routes into Raqqa. And in both Iraq and Syria, ISIL has not been able to reclaim any significant territory that they have lost. So I want to repeat, ISIL has not had a major successful offensive operation in either Syria or Iraq in a full year. Even ISIL's leaders know they're going to keep losing. In their message to followers, they're increasingly acknowledging that they may lose Mosul and Raqqa. And ISIL is right. They will lose them. And we'll keep hitting them and pushing them back and driving them out until they do. In other words, ISIL turns out not to be invincible. They are, in fact, inevitably going to be defeated. But we do recognize at the same time that the situation uh, is complex, and this cannot be solved by military force alone. That's why last month the United States and countries around the world pledged more than $2 billion in new funds to help Iraqis stabilize and rebuild their communities. It's why we're working with Iraq so that the military campaign to liberate Mosul is matched with humanitarian and political efforts to protect civilians and promote inclusive governance and development. So ISIL cannot return by exploiting divisions or new grievances. In Syria, as I've repeatedly said, defeating ISIL and al-Qaeda requires an end to the civil war. And the Assad regime's brutality against the Syrian people, which pushes people into the arms of extremists. The regime and its allies continue to violate the cessation of hostilities, including with vicious attacks on defenseless civilians, medieval sieges against cities like Aleppo and blocking food from reaching families that are starving. It is deplorable, and the depravity of the Syrian regime has rightly earned the condemnation of the world. Russia's direct involvement in these actions over the last several weeks raises very serious questions about their commitment to pulling the situation back from the brink. The U.S. remains prepared to work with Russia to try to reduce the violence and strengthen our efforts against ISIL and al-Qaeda in Syria. But so far, Russia has failed to take the necessary steps. Given the deteriorating situation, it is time for Russia to show that it is serious about pursuing these objectives. Beyond Syria and Iraq, we'll keep working with allies and partners to go after ISIL wherever it tries to spread. At the request of Libya's Government of National Accord, we are conducting strikes in support of government-aligned forces as they fight to retake CERT from ISIL, and we will continue to support the government's efforts to secure their country. In Afghanistan, one of the reasons that I decided to largely maintain our current force posture was so that we could keep eliminating ISIL's presence there. And we delivered another blow last month when we took out a top ISIL leader in Afghanistan, Umar Khalifa. Finally, it should be clear by now, and no one knows this better than our military leaders, that even as we need to crush ISIL on the battlefield, their military defeat will not be enough. So long as their twisted ideology persists and drives people to violence, then groups like ISIL will keep emerging, and the international community will continue to be at risk in getting sucked into the kind of global whack-a-mole where we're always reacting to the latest threat or lone actor. And that's why we're also working to counter violent extremism more broadly, including the social, economic, and political factors that help fuel groups like ISIL and al-Qaeda in the first place. Nothing will do more to discredit ISIL and its phony claims to being a caliphate than when it loses uh, its base in Raqqa and in Mosul. And we're going to keep working with partners, including Muslim countries and communities, especially online, to expose ISIL for what they are murderers who kill innocent people, including Muslim families and children as they break their Ramadan f fast and who set off bombs in Medina near the Prophet's Mosque, one of the holiest sites in Islam. Uh, moreover, we refuse to let terrorists and voices of division undermine the unity and the values of diversity and pluralism that keep, keep our nation strong. One of the reasons that America's armed forces are the best in the world is because we draw on the skills and the talents of all of our citizens from all backgrounds and faiths, including patriotic Muslim Americans who risk and give their lives for our freedom. 
And I think the entire world was inspired this past Sunday when Muslims across France joined their Catholic neighbors at Mass and in a moving display of solidarity prayed together. The greeting they extended to each other has to be the message we echo in all of our countries and all of our communities. Peace be with you and also with you. Now, uh, before I take some questions, I also want to say a few words on another topic. As our public health experts have been warning for some time, we are now seeing the first locally transmitted cases of the Zika virus by mosquitoes in the continental United States. Uh, this was predicted and predictable. So far, we've seen 15 cases in the Miami area. We're taking this extremely seriously. Our CDC experts are on the ground working shoulder to shoulder with Florida health authorities. There is a very aggressive effort underway to control mosquitoes there, and pregnant women have been urged to stay away from the particular neighborhood that we're focused on. We'll keep working as one team, federal, state, and local, to try to slow and limit the spread of the virus. I do want to be very clear, though. Our public health experts do not expect to see the kind of widespread, uh, widespread outbreaks of Zika here that we've seen in Brazil or in Puerto Rico. The kind of mosquitoes that are most likely to carry Zika are limited to certain regions of our country. But we cannot be complacent because we do expect to see more Zika cases. And even though the symptoms for most people are mild, many may never even know that they have it, We've seen that the complications for pregnant women and their babies can be severe. So I again want to encourage every American to learn what they can do to help stop Zika by going to CDC.gov. In addition, Congress needs to do its job. Fighting Zika costs money. Helping Puerto Rico deal with its Zika crisis costs money. Research into new vaccines. And by the way, NIH just announced the first clinical trials in humans. That costs money. And that's why my administration proposed an urgent request for more funding back in February. Not only did the Republican-led Congress not pass our request, they worked to cut it. And then they left for summer recess without passing any new funds for the fight against Zika. Meanwhile, our experts at the NIH and CDC, the folks on the front lines, have been doing their best in making do by moving funds from other areas, but now the money that we need to fight Zika is rapidly running out. The situation is getting critical. For instance, without sufficient funding, NIH critical trials, uh, clinical trials and the possibilities of a vaccine, which is well within reach, could be delayed. So this is not the time for politics. More than 40 U.S. service members have now contracted Zika overseas. In 50 U.S. states, we know of more than 1,800 cases of Zika connected to travel to infected areas, and that includes nearly 500 pregnant women. Zika is now present in almost every part of Puerto Rico, and now we have the first local transmission in Florida, and there will certainly be more. And meanwhile, Congress is on a summer recess. A lot of folks talk about protecting Americans from threats. Well, Zika is a serious threat to Americans, especially babies, right now. So once again, I want to urge the American people to call their members of Congress and tell them to do their job. Deal with this threat. Help protect the American people from Zika. With that, I'm going to uh, take some questions. I'm going to start uh, with someone who just assumed the second most powerful office in the land, uh, Jeff Mason, <laughs> the uh, new Correspondence Association president, also from Reuters. Jeff. Hardly um, powerful, and happy birthday. Thank you very much. As Islamic State loses territory, you and other officials have said uh, that it is becoming a more traditional terrorist group. Are you satisfied that the United States and its allies have shifted to strategy sufficiently to address that change? And secondly, given your comments this week about Donald Trump's volatility and lack of fitness to be president, are you concerned that he will be receiving security briefings about ISIS and other sensitive national security issues? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm never satisfied uh, with uh, our response because if you're satisfied, uh, that means the problem's solved and it's not. So uh, we just spent a couple hours uh, meeting with my top national security uh, folks to look at what more can be done. Uh, it is absolutely necessary for us to defeat ISIL in Iraq and Syria. 
it is not sufficient, but it is necessary. Because so long as they have those bases, they can use their propaganda uh, to suggest that somehow there's still some caliphate uh, being born. Uh, and that can insinuate itself then in the minds of uh, folks uh, who may be willing to travel there or carry out terrorist attacks. It's also destabilizing for countries in the region uh, at a time when the region's already unstable. So uh, you know, I am pleased with the progress that we've made on the ground in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we're far from freeing Mosul and Raqqa. Uh, but what we've shown is, is that when it comes to conventional fights, ISIL can be beaten with partners on the ground, so long as they've got the support uh, from coalition forces that we've been providing. Uh, in the meantime, though, you're seeing ISIL carry out external uh, terrorist acts, and they've learned something. They've adapted from Al Qaeda, which had a much more centralized operation and tried to plan very elaborate attacks. And what ISIL has figured out is that if they can convince a handful of people or even one person to carry out an attack on a subway or at a parade or uh, you know, some other public venue uh, and kill scores of people as opposed to thousands of people, uh, it still creates uh, the kinds of fear and concern uh, that uh, elevates their profile. So, uh, in some ways, rooting out these networks for small